<laughs> All right, hello and welcome to a new episode of the QCast. What number are we on now? 27? 27, Eddie. Dang. <laughs> How you doing? I've never done 27 of anything in my life. Yeah, this is a new record. <laughs> it's better than my dissertation. <laughs> Higher achievement. You know, someone was asking me about the podcast the other day, and I referred them to, uh, you know, your main channel page on YouTube, and mm -hmm. I think one of the first ones that comes up is episode one of yeah. this podcast. And let me tell you, the the stuff that you do on camera setup and lighting, the podcast looks so good compared, compared to, to episode, episode one. one. <laughs> the, the thumbnail on that one is awful, too. Oh, <laughs> Just man. threw it together with this one screenshot, didn't piece anything So together. much more together now. Yeah. You do a great job. Well, thank you, Eddie. You know, it's it's starting to add up. I'm you know, just... I come in here every week and everything's all set up. The lighting's there. The camera's there. I just come in and, and you, start yakking. You're going to jinx, jinx us. <laughs> One yeah. of the cameras well, is going to blow the up. One camera now. I'm going to forget to, to turn on the audio. <laughs> Something's going to happen. But yeah, so this week we've got a few things to talk about. We're going to talk about some Paddle database updates for the new analytics on the website. All right. Uh, some new USAP tools that I heard about recently. Uh, the whole new wave of titanium paddles that's forthcoming. Uh, a little bit of PPA Las Vegas. Uh, we've got some paddles of the week to discuss. We're looking so. at primarily the Rhombus Ripple. So you and I have been hitting, hitting with those now for a week, a yeah, couple weeks even. That's good. And it's a good paddle. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Uh, Ethos Dynamis and some uh, Kevlar paddles from a company called Synergy. Okay. And then we got some deep dive. I'm going to do a little polypropylene follow-up. And then uh, I'm going to look at putting a slice cap on a standard wide body paddle. See if I Ooh. like it. Try and keep this to three hours or less. <laughs> That's right. And then finally some Q&A. So. All right. Hey, before we jump into that, you want to talk about our favorite clothes? Yes, indeed. At least my <laughs> favorite. Um, the Centerline Athletic shirts, man, and shorts. Still my go-to. Um, unfortunately, mine was in the wash the other day, so I reached for another brand, and I, I played in, in heat and sweat, and that thing came out still stanky and <laughs> nasty and <laughs> frankly a little yellowed <laughs> from all the gross sweat uh -huh. but these centerline shirts man they're amazing they spoil you i see you have the long sleeved on oh. they haven't sent me mine yet i wore this today and and i didn't do a whole lot of exercise because you were just mopping the floor with me today <laughs> but <laughs> i could probably wear this shirt tomorrow and the day after without washing it and it so, it is fresh man so the Anti-microbial properties work on these. They don't stink too much. They don't. I don't smell anything to you. I, no, and you're sitting right next to me. And we just <laughs> finished playing. Yes, indeed. There you go, buddy. <laughs> Good yep. stuff. Thanks, Centerline. All right, Eddie. Let's move on to, to latest news. So uh, I do have some updates on the paddle database on my website. So a couple three weeks ago, we added some analytics. Mm -hmm. I was in with some developers to to make some tools for people to, to use and compare paddles with bar charts and that sort of thing. So big shout out to Rich and Victor who helped me with those. They're, they're both fans of the podcast and, and pickleball players themselves. Uh, just been an enormous help. So we've gotten some some feedback from people using the analytics. And first first and foremost, the original Excel database that I had up did not go away. And it's not under the same Paddle Database tab, but if you look at the top of johnkeypickleball.com, there is a raw database. So the raw data for the Paddle Database, it, it's still there. The Excel spreadsheet still there if you like using that. And, you know, I'm used to it also. I kind of go to that first and then start playing with the analytics. It's still there. Just check it out. Same for the ball database. It's still up there too under raw data for, for balls. So that's still there. There's a lot of confusion about that. Just, just go take a look. Uh, also, the homepage, when you go to the analytics for the Paddle database, it's a little cluttery. So Rich, the developer, limited it to five comparisons, thinking, okay, that's going to clean things up. A lot of people didn't like that because they were like, well, I want to compare more than five paddles. So we unlocked that again. So it's still going to be a little cluttery when you go, but you can go in and filter. On the left, you drop down and choose companies. On the mm -hmm. right, you drop down and choose the paddle models, and you can compare as many as you want. It gets really cluttery after five, but apparently people wanted to do that. Also, I'm working on a glossary. So this is going to go, so I kind of put on the back burner the, the book of Q, right? <laughs> that was going to be a thing earlier this year. And 
Chris and Will and Braden and I were, were kind of working on it together, just a little bit here and there. Uh, but the glossary is going to be, okay, how do we define these categories that you can, you can see now on the paddle database, the analytics, so things like so high, mid, low spin, high, mid, low price, uh, high, mid, low swing weight, those sorts of things. So I'll have those defined so you know what we're talking about in the paddle database. Any chance we can get that company list sorted A to Z instead of Z to A? Hey, that's another one. I, 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 that's something I've been meaning to ask Rich. So yes, thank you, Eddie. Uh, all right, all right. So that's that. Let's move on to something I heard uh, through Neonic, my communication with Neonic, and they sent me a couple of X-ray photographs of their new Neonic flare sent to them by USAP. So apparently, USAP is now X-raying paddles for their similarity testing protocol. So it showed, I'll put it up on the B-roll, it showed the mm. originally submitted flare on the left and then the newly submitted flare on the right and it said similarity, similarity protocol passed, something like that. And I think that's really cool. Uh, that's a new tool that I didn't know the USAP had. So uh, tip of the hat to USAP for doing something fairly progressive. That's, you know what, I, I've been meaning to are trying to find some commercial x-ray facilities to x-ray paddles because I think that would be really cool for paddle reviews to show what's inside without dissecting it. And uh, I've had no luck, Eddie, but I called a few places and just cold calling medical facilities that have <laughs> x-ray machines. And I'm like, yeah, can I, can I bring in possibly some equipment to get x-rayed? And they're like, no, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm like, sports equipment? And they're like, well, we don't really do that. What what exactly do you need? Pickleball paddle? <laughs> and they're like, you're crazy. <laughs> don't call us again. So I, Maybe you could spend a little extra time at TSA on your next uh, trip to a tournament. Exactly. Yeah, befriend the TSA people. Uh -huh. So I've had no luck. I, and I see one facility that does, like, really cheap x-rays and uh, nationwide, and I even called them, and they're like, no, forget it. So if anybody knows, anybody listening – knows of <laughs> any kind of uh, something that could suffice for an x-ray or mm -hmm. a, some facility that might be able to do it, let me know because I think that'd be cool. But it would also be neat for the USAP to test that. And I wonder if they're also looking for core crushing because the, the x-rays they showed of the neonic flare had really nice uh, octagonal polygon, uh, octag octagonal polypropylene in the right. interior. You know, it, it's clearly not all mushed together and it's it would be really clear to see in an x-ray a crushed core so that might be a trigger for usap to, to go and say okay this is this is warrants a kind of historical analysis so we'll bring it back in two weeks and after it's been played for a lot to see if it's I'd be curious crushed. to see how something like a gearbox or a, a yola would show up under x-ray with the foam components mm -hmm. potentially different densities of foam yeah along with the pp um, yeah that could be really interesting. Yeah, I'd love to see that gearbox, especially. I'm pretty sure I know what the Yola Gen 3s and Mod TA15 would look like, but Yola would be interesting with all the ribs and the, yeah, different density foams. Right. Cool. All right. So, Eddie, there are, do you remember when we had a wave of Kevlar paddles? It's still going on. But oh, yeah. Early this year, we were like, expect a lot of Kevlar paddles in the pipeline. And well, I boy, guess is there something else? <laughs> boy, did they come. There is something else <laughs> right now, and that is titanium. So uh, the, Not lava. <laughs> bread and butter shotgun. <laughs> bread and butter shotgun. Bread and butter shogun was the first in the market using the titanium weave, so these titanium threads yeah. in the carbon fiber weave surface. And it was popular, very popular. And titanium has kind of a unique feel to it in terms of the performance properties of a paddle and there are a lot of companies right now with titanium paddles in the works i can't name a few of them i haven't asked but we do know that that i talked about this last week in the podcast uh, for example neonic is coming out with a standard shape uh titanium paddle titanium raw carbon fiber weave yes well yeah titanium carbon fiber weave with the raw carbon fiber texture well, the Shogun was a, a great start. I really enjoyed that paddle. It wasn't quite the shape that I would have mm -hmm. liked right. um, to see some of these. 
titanium paddles and a wide body, I think will be really interesting. Yeah. So they're coming. We will get to play with all shapes and varieties yeah, of yes. titanium. <laughs> <laughs> I did ask ne- Neonic for some details on what exactly the, the manufacturing process looks like for these titanium weaves, because it looks like carbon fiber 3K twill weave with one thread of titanium every uh. row every toe of those those uh, weaves. So I don't know if the tiny titanium thread is woven in over and under the the other toes. So um, did you say that you hit that paddle already? Yes. We'll hit it next next time we go out together. All it's, right. It's a good paddle. You know, looking back, we, we all thought 2023 was such a crazy year for pickleball paddle change mm-hmm. going from Gen 1 to Gen 2. I think 2024 is even more dynamic. It's been, it's, been, it's it's crazy. It's been bananas, and then all the the controversy, controversy, and and all the flame wars between agencies, and oh, it's been yeah. it's been our, crazy. Year end recap show. It's going to be nuts. <laughs> yeah. Did you watch any of the PPA last week? I did. I watched a bit here and there. I don't get a chance to really sit down for all day sessions, but when I'm working, I'll I'll tune in to pickleball TV and have it, you know, beside me and listening in. And, you know, I just noticed that, um, on Roku, uh, they have a live TV option and pickleball TV is one of the free options. That's it's, fantastic. It's great. I didn't even know that until I just happened to turn on the Roku the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same for, I have, uh, Comcast, you know, uh, streaming and I was looking for pickleball TV. I couldn't find it. I was searching for it. It wouldn't show up. And then I was randomly surfing, and I saw it there. So they need to tie it in with a search engine, but it's it's there now. So I just yeah. found mine, too. That's fun, though. So any notable games that you, you saw? Um, I, I caught a lot of the women's singles. Mm. Um, I was watching um, Kate Fahey because she had come out of a win from Utah, PPA, uh-huh. and was flying high and worked her way to the finals of – PPA Las Vegas and right. just got demolished. <laughs> Annalie An- Waters had a chip on her shoulder from, uh, yeah, from all the attention. She's like, everybody's talking about Kate. What about me? Uh, so, yeah, that was tough. That was tough to watch, but congrats to Kate for making it that far. She's she's clearly going to be a contender for I, top I still can't quite figure it out. I mean, ALW has just the heart of a lion to oh. go out there and just – steamroll people, steamroll other professional athletes. I mean, these are, you know, you're run-of-the-mill rec players, obviously. Uh, There's not a fighting chance right now. Oh, man. You're right. She is the toughest mental player (laughs) out there right now in pickleball. 100%. So dominant. Yeah. It's crazy with all the people now playing pickleball. Uh And for her to be that dominant still is really an incredible story. It is incredible. They held it at the Fountain Blue in Las Vegas. Have you been to the Fountain Blue? No. That's a new one, it, isn't it? It's a new one, yeah. yeah. That's where we stayed when we went up to that Thrive event. So really nice convention center, uh, casino. Um, but it looked like they were just put these pickle rolls. That's not the brand of the... Of uh, the Acrotech or something? Acrotech, yeah. yes, thank you. It's like they just rolled it over the carpet. <laughs> and it sounded like it. And... There were so many horrible bounces the entire— How do you get any bounce out of something like yeah, that? Yeah, sometimes it just rolled, and there, people were freaking out, and people were getting injured. And I don't know if it had to, had to play a role. The, the carpet under the flooring had to play a role in these rolled ankles, no pun intended. So Annalie Waters on, on final Sunday rolled her ankle. Kwang Dong, uh, I didn't see that match, and it's not up mm. on YouTube, but he had to pull from the tournament because he rolled his ankle, I assume. So it's just, you know, these professional <laughs> pickleball athletes run and slide to catch the ball. You see that a lot, right. especially in singles. Which requires a degree of firmness underfoot. Uh, yeah. When it's squishy underneath, it's just going to grab your foot and hold it in place. So have you confirmed it. that that's the case? They just rolled it over carpet? I have not confirmed, but it sure sounded like it. It looked like it, and... <sighs> You yeah. think at least they'd throw down plywood under the That could have been a possibility. The, even but that. you heard you heard the ball bounce. It sounded hollow and soft and it just yeah, that's unfortunate. It was unfortunate. It looked amazing. It was really pretty inside. I'm a big fan of, you know, ha- having a giant indoor venue like this. And I think Fountain Blue is a great place. Hopefully they can find a way to either temporarily remove the carpet next time or find a different 
convention center. That place is gigantic. I walked around for like an hour one day just circling it and finding these gigantic cavernous rooms that nobody was in. I was like, this would be a perfect venue for pickleball, and, and it was fun to see it used. That is crazy that there's a space that big because there's already a convention center in Las Vegas. That's <laughs> yeah. Hum- I mean, what what possibly could they be doing with a space that, well, pickleball, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Yeah, <laughs> All right, so I, I did notice, back to our core theme of, of gear and paddles, the John's brothers were both playing with the 3S paddle. All right. And that was the same as same case as, as the lot prior tournament, although Ben John seems to have used it the entire tournament here in Las Vegas versus just a couple of games here and there uh, on the previous tournament. So you could hear, you could see that new graphics and the paddles sounded different. So it wasn't just a case like, back when the Gen 3 was around, of them playing with the Gen 2 with the face of a Gen 3 because uh-huh. you could hear the, the difference in the sound. The sound of these was clearly the, the propulsion core. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's pr- clearly a propulsion core. And again, big question, is this 3S the same as the Gen 3, same as the Mod mm-hmm. TA-15? Rumor, rumor has it that it's a more muted version, but... You haven't gotten see. those yet, have haven't you? haven't gotten it. Okay. Yola's going to send it to me this week, so... So Ben was playing with the Perseus shape? Ble- ben with the Perseus shape, Colin with, with the, the, his, his Scorpius. color scheme, Scorpius. Although, there was one... The first game of one of their matches, it was the same color scheme for Colin, but it sure looked like either a hybrid shape or an elongated shape. And I kept pausing the video and, and taking a closer look, and mm. I couldn't get, like, a quite... A perfect still shot. And then the second game, it looked like a standard Scorpius. So maybe he's testing out a hybrid shape. They didn't quite look as elongated as the Perseus, but it definitely looked longer. So I don't know. That's, or it could be just my bad eyes <laughs> or my imagination. But did you see? <laughs> I'm surprised that Memes of Pickleball didn't do something with this match. But So the Johns brothers were playing... Um, Johnny Pickleball and Luke Wasson uh, in the round of 32. And Colin starts out serving and just wails on the ball, like nipple high, just wham, and they immediately called for a high serve fault. And so he doesn't, doesn't argue, sends it back. And the whole time, Colin was just going aggro with the serves and his play style, and Ben was going aggro. There, there were like two double faults by the Johns brothers in that match, you know, with both of them. Either Colin got called for serving high, and then call, and then Ben hit it long, or vice versa. So it was bananas. Uh, and then, so really aggressive gameplay from CJ, and they finished the match where Ben hits the hard drive, and Colin cleans it up with a shake and bake. So Colin bakes the final point, and they win the match. And I was like, "What is going on?" <laughs> And then the most hilarious part was the interview afterwards. So uh, Dave was asking, Dave Fleming, asking John, but like immediately he was like, what was up with the serves? And they both start laughing and they're like, this is our our new aggressive play style. (laughs) And then Dave mentioned, and he was asking Ben, he was like, what did you think when Colin finished up the point with a shake and bake? And and Ben said something like, oh, that's an elite athlete right there. (laughs) I had a vision of this elite athletic form in front of me. (laughs) It was just hilarious they're both in on the joke but clearly he's just being sarcastic because I, I think neither one of them thinks that they're you know top athletes like ben has actually mentioned that before clearly he's athletic but he doesn't think he compares to like elite athletes in basketball football okay. et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and and it's just i thought it was funny because they were you could tell they were just like screw it man if people are gonna come out of the gates hot with us we're gonna do it back to them hey they got a sense of humor too finally yeah I like it. That's cool. It was fun to see him. I didn't see that. I could have to backtrack on that one. It was fun to see him laugh and have a little fun. Although, they did get eliminated right. in the quarterfinals uh, from Riley and Alshon. Did you see that one? Yeah, I did see that one. Uh, but had to feel good for Riley also. <laughs> They've had a long-term rivalry he has with the Johns brothers. So for him to Where are they now in, in terms of tournament wins for the year? Are they at 500? Who the Johns Brothers. Brothers? I don't know. I don't know the the score, but they are. I mean, they've lost a lot this yeah. year. Uh, Colin not happy. He's becoming increasingly bitter and angry at the net and the balls. Well, <laughs> if you notice well, that, all the chatter is when when are they gonna move on? What's that? Oh yeah, that when when is Ben yeah. gonna find a new partner? Right. 
Yeah, we'll see if it happens. I'm sure if they continue this record, it's, it's bound to happen. Right. Uh, Gabe and Andre take gold again for the second time in a row. That's incredible. For Men's Devils. Good, good on them. Um, that's all I want to talk about. What do you PPA. think of these indoor tournaments? I mean, you, you mentioned that you thought it was kind of cool to have a, a big venue like that. Yeah. Have you ever played in an indoor tournament? I like playing indoor tournaments as long as the lighting is, is good. Yeah, that's always a factor, right? Yeah. And I've always thought that they don't look as good on TV as outdoor. There's a certain pop and, you know, the sunsets and sunrises and even midday sun just makes the tournament look better. It's a better looking product. But it it was looking pretty good on TV. looked dark to me. TV. I don't, I don't yeah, a little dark, but I don't mind that. Uh, I, I think there's a potential for it to look better on TV, for them to do things on TV to make it look better. But it's still, it's still it's not at that point where it looks as good as outdoor pickleball. Yeah, lighting is like the primary thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great having all the other elements kind of taken care of. Right. But flooring, I guess, would be the number two thing. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> what you see. They need some better flooring for sure. I mean, it, honestly, it doesn't matter what the brand is. You're going to get bubbles. I, there's just, I don't think, any way to make a flooring surface that's that large and not have some bubbles underneath. And, yeah. and that causes issues. Yeah. Oh, one new thing for the next tournament is they will be introducing 240 frames per second hey. video review. So we will be able to clearly see where the ball bounces. Awesome. Yes. Let's move on to Paddles of the Week. Yeah. So, Eddie, you, you and know I... this is my favorite part of the show. <laughs> it's always my favorite, too. <laughs> what a coincidence. You and I have been hitting with the uh, new Rhombus Ripples, which are not out yet, but they will be by the end of this month. I think around the 27th is supposed to be the release date. So all, that, it, all those issues with the delisting have been resolved? As far as I know. Okay. Uh, so, yes, these... These on paper are now approved. They're both 14 millimeter, and it comes in two shapes, the R1, which is their aero curve elongated, and the new R2 shape, which is their standard or wide body. Some people call it. I call it standard because yeah. it's 16 by 8. It feels like a wide body. It feels like a wide body. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is like the Hyperion shape, and this is like the Scorpius shape, basically. And I dig that R2 shape, man. Yeah. Yeah, me too. So I, I did have a pretty long conversation with Dong. I'm not going to get too deep. I don't know what I can share, what I can't. But uh, but they are USAP approved. But um, so far, so good. <laughs> we'll see if they make it to the finish line. <laughs> Poor Dong has been working on this for over a year now, this, this concept. So I'm not going to get too much in the weeds either on construction, but it does have – it's a foam-enhanced core – and it is. It also uses the same carbon fiber grid that has been used in the Nova before this and the Pulsar FX. And that's one component of it. That grid goes over some foam in the core, giving it some firmness. Uh, and there's other components. That I don't know if Don wants me to talk about. You can actually see the ripples. Have you noticed the, the ripples? Yeah, I was going to ask what those are. Yeah, those are... Similar to the carbon fiber ribs in the Gearbox Pro Powers, although not the same. They're not encapsulated. They're open foam with the grid over the top, but there are, there are some carbon fiber supports in there, which gives it that wavy look. So, yeah, at first I thought it was going to be along the lines of the, what was that paddle from Diadem, the vice that had kind of the strings in it? Oh, you mean that Pro Kinex Pro Spin. Was it Pro Kinex? Yeah. Okay. That was the first paddle I reviewed. <laughs> it had like that? those stringers in it, uh -huh. and uh, I thought it might be there to sort of grab the ball mm -hmm. more than, but it's really not. It's it's really all about power distribution. This, as far as this goes, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, th th this isn't a gimmicky thing where they're getting more spin with right. these ridges. But I've been I've been hitting mostly with the R two. I hit with the R one for probably six games or so so far but the r2 has been in my bag and that's been what paddle i've been playing with for every game for the most part for the past week and a half uh you too what are your thoughts on these paddles eddie oh man when the yola gen 3s came out i i believe i said on this show that i thought they were the best paddles out there this is right up there uh in terms of just overall power spin uh, for as much power as it has, controllability. 
Um, it is a very consistent hard hitter. Whereas with the Yola, I mean, it was sort of that, you know, the higher up on the, the face you went, the more power you would feel or be able to realize. Mm-hmm. With this, it's just very uniform. That's a good point. How about you? Yeah. No, I, I, I did run the metrics on it on both of these paddles. And they fall in terms of power pop output, they fall right in between the gearbox and Yolas up at the top of the yep. firepower chart and the paddle tech bantams below them. So they're filling that gap in between. So they're not quite as hot as the Yola Gen 3s out of the box, at least. And they're a little bit hotter than the paddle techs. But I totally agree that. One of the things I didn't necessarily like about the Gen 3s, I would say that the main flaw is that diving board effect where it's more responsive further up on the face, closer to the right. top of the paddle yep. than it is in the center of the paddle, which, you know, I tend to hit it up there anyways. So it didn't affect me too much, but I do like, a, you know, a little bit more forgiveness across the face, which the Ripple does have, especially the, the R2 is really forgiving. Now, it starts out really light. 7.6 ounces or something for the R2. It's crazy maneuverable. Super light, yeah. lightweight, maneuverable. But with that low stock weight, there is some twisting, you know, yeah. and it does play better, in my opinion, with some perimeter weighting, for sure, which we played around with today. We'll talk about it in the... Well, we can talk about your setup, for sure. Well, uh, I've got, uh, right now, six grams on each side. And normally, that puts the swing weight to a point where it's getting to be a little unmanageable. Mm-hmm. But this starts off at, a, I think, like a 104 or 105 swing weight, really low. And even with this much weight on, I'm still not even at 110. Yeah. So it's still wicked maneuverable. I love it. Um, spin on it is great, too. And I think, actually, I know that the spin is a result, the superior spin is a result of dwell time rather than the grit on the face. Nice. So Dong just updated the grit, the peel ply on his Nova series. If you remember, the, the original Novas didn't get that great a spin. Right. He was using that really fine peel ply, which sometimes gets good spin, but on the Novas, we all got like 1,700 and below, which these days is lo- very low spin, right? So I knew that Dong was putting upgraded spin on the Novas. I asked him to send me the upgraded one so I could update the spin numbers in my database, and he sent me those. At the same time, he sent me the ripples, and I asked him, I'm like, okay, is this exactly the same peel ply and layup on both on both the ripple and the Novas? And he was like, yeah, exactly. So I got, with the Novas, just over 2,000 RPM mm-hmm. on average for both the R1 and the R3. And for the ripples, it was high 2,300s, so Ooh. really elite spin. Even though it's the same peel ply, it's the same texture, it's the same layup in terms of the rock the carbon fiber underneath the peel ply which tells me something else is going on besides the texture and the surface layers and that that's dwell time you can feel it when you hit the ball you can really switch your grip to semi-western or even full western you know and still get get spin on the ball get superior spin without the ball sliding across the surface because it pockets the ball i love the way you can work the ball with this paddle i was struggling with some of the other paddles we played with today because uh, we started with the Ripple, mm-hmm. and everything else just kind of paled by comparison, unfortunately, yeah. for those other paddles. But, um, there, you know, we don't have a metric for dwell time, but I've got to think that this has got to be up there. And the, man, the, the sweet spot on this is is large. I'd say at least as large as the Gen 3 Yolas, which had a really nice with sweet With the spot. additional weight. After the weight, it's I feel like it's better. Yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it's because it's more responsive across the face of the paddle. But, you know, I, I feel more comfortable through the transition zone with the R2. I haven't had enough time with the R1. That Same. one's going to be more – it's more powerful, less poppy than the R2. Uh, but given that it's such a powerful paddle, I was surprised how much control I was able to get from him. Clearly, there's a trade off. It's not as controllable as a Selkirk Lux, for example. But I didn't have as many problems with pop-ups and – and working my way through the transition zone as I thought I would, given that it had that much power. I've had great results with blocks as well. I mean, it's really just a matter of holding the paddle up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's really no force involved. Right. You just hold the paddle up, and it, it does what it's supposed to do Yeah, quite well. It's got a 
low clunky sound, which I like. Oh about. man, the sound is great. It's very deep. Uh huh. Yeah, it doesn't have that high pitched thing that hurts your ears with the polypropylene. It's loud though. It can be loud. Yeah. Yeah. But I like the sound of it. I love the play style, and you know, it brings up the ethical concerns on whether where do we draw the line for power and pop, as we keep talking about, and. For some people, this is going to be over that point, but it does find a nice spot in between the most powerful paddles on the market right now that aren't delisted or aren't the gearboxes, right? Which is the Paddletech Bantams and similar paddles. And the, the Ripple sits just above those, but below the gearbox. Now, the question for me is, are these things going to break in or will they break eventually? And will the break-in period be similar to the Gearbox Pro Powers and the Ultimate, where you do get increased power mm -hmm. as they go on? Great question. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, I will test for that before the review the, at the end of this month, for sure. This, to me, felt more powerful than the Yola Scorpius Gen 3 out of the box. Did it? Okay. But less powerful with the, uh, compared to the Gen 3 over time. Okay, so you haven't you haven't noticed increased power over time? No, yeah. I haven't. Okay, and I've been playing with it pretty solidly for a week now. Yeah, that would be nice if it did not break down and get more powerful. Because <laughs> I think if it got any more powerful than yeah, you're, you're when you pulled it out of the box the there, then it's just going to be another ridiculous power paddle. <laughs> you know, yeah. not ridiculous. I shouldn't say that. The, the dong has worked really hard on this and, and it's produced an amazing paddle and given, uh, given people what they want. This right? is a special paddle. It's a special paddle for sure. Uh, it is going to be expensive. It's $250 retail, which I think is a fair price given do it. the, the R&D and the technology behind it. But just, just so you know, I, all their paddles so far have been sub 200. This one's not going to be. Uh, but you guys been doing R&D now for over a year on this and sunk a lot of money into this. So uh, I think it's a fair price. Uh, the R1 also plays well. It's not my shape anymore. So I'm, you know, I'll, I'll hit with this some more before I do the review. But it felt, like I said, more powerful with big swings than the R2, but less poppy at the kitchen with shorter swings than the R2, yeah. as expected, given the shape differences. You know, John, we have access to so many paddles, hundreds of paddles, and, mm -hmm. and maybe one or two of those paddles out of 50 or 100 really makes an impact on me. Right. The Gen 3 was one of them, admittedly. This is one of them as well. For sure. It's a special paddle. Yep. All right. Uh, anything else on, on the Ripple? No. Looking forward to uh, playing with it more and just making note of any changes that happen over time. We'll report back on those. Well, Eddie, a few weeks ago we did a podcast on Kevlar wide bodies, which included standard shape paddles. And we wanted to include the Ethos Dunamis in this, and he tried to send me his paddle, but it didn't get here. It got here the same day that we were recording, so we okay. didn't get a chance to hit it. Yeah. But we have hit with it, so we got the production model, and uh, I just wanted to circle back around to this since we didn't give it due credit originally. So uh, we hit with this today. You've hit with it a few, few games before. Um, first of all, this thing is really light, really light swing weight, and extremely maneuverable. Um, you know, it's 14 millimeter. Uh, the holes in the face are going to reduce some of the weight and increase increase maneuverability. It's got that alien <laughs> face. I don't know, man. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the context. That's uh, painting a picture there. So we know it's going to be a very fast in the hand paddle. Uh, what are your thoughts on? How it played. You know what? I think you should go first on this. One. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's a good attempt. Uh, not not my paddle, and I, I don't think it'll be a favorite for many people. Right now, in terms of Kevlar paddles, it is by far the most maneuverable and lightweight. So, if you if that's your number one priority for a paddle, right? Like if you've played with the Electrum. What's that series that they put out? Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking super about. Super lightweight edgeless yep. paddles. Uh, if you played with those and loved them, then and you're looking for a Kevlar paddle, then this might be your thing. But I'd say there's some issues. It, it, I would I would have some suggestions before yeah. for this one in particular uh, for a second version so for some modifications. So first of all, I, I didn't even try playing with it without the 
lead tape. I, I ran the metrics on it without the tungsten tape, but then I added it because I knew I would not like the feel of it. So something about the neck really flexes a lot, and it gives me a, a weird vibration buzz in my hands. It reminded me kind of of those, like the the original Honolulu paddles that we played with, the super elongated ones with the hole in the throat, uh-huh. who had a really flexible paddle. Yep. Uh, neck, sorry. Um, so that's one issue. I didn't, didn't care for it much. Uh, another one is that there's no real kind of standout thing about it. It's a, it's a stiff feeling face. Doesn't quite feel like Kevlar. It feels more like raw carbon fiber. There's not much power at all. It's really low power from the baseline. You really swing and you don't get much power. There's not much pop either at the kitchen, which was surprising for a really lightweight paddle. Normally when you can speed it up really quickly, the paddle, it gives you a lot of There's just not enough there to put anything on the ball. No. And the spin wasn't good either. (laughs) That spin was, I think it was 1,700 or so is what I got on average. Uh, Okay. Maybe it it shouldn't be that way necessarily for this. It's, you know, it's the it's the Kevlar weave, the 3K12 with the peel ply over it. So it should be up at around 2000. Maybe I got a dud in terms of the texture. But overall, I'm just, nothing really wowed me about the paddle. Yeah, I'm with you there, John. Uh, you know, it's, I agree. It, it is very lightweight. I suppose if you are someone struggling with weight, that this might be an option if you're looking for Kevlar. But otherwise, it felt very toy like to me. Uh, it felt, um, <laughs> there, there's so many better options for a Kevlar paddle. Right. Um, you review the Monarchs. I think that's a, a great choice. Uh, the Jelly Bean is a, a great. That's not a Monarch paddle. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not a Kevlar paddle. Not, but, but for a, a great, budget paddle, yeah, hundred uh, bucks. I, I think you're, 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 you're in great shape. Yeah. Uh, and those don't feel like toys. They feel like athletic equipment. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I appreciate the graphics. I appreciate what they've done with kind of the look of it. I think there's some more work to do to yeah. to get it there. Yeah, I think with some adjustments, it could be a good paddle. Yeah, but I never struck the ball today where I, I felt like, well, man, I just hit that ball really solidly. Yeah, it's true. Felt a little chintzy. Uh huh. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on to a new company we haven't talked about yet, and, and the company is new. It just went online. Their website went online a couple or three weeks ago. Uh, the company's called Synergy. And they do have a subscription-based model if you choose to use that, or you can buy the paddles outright. So this is... Wait, a, a subscription to what? Just a new paddle once well, in a while, periodically, whatever that is? Yeah, so their subscription model, I should have wrote it all down, but basically you pay, I think it's $30 a month, maybe $39. I think it's 30 And with that, you get a new premier paddle, premium paddle every six months. You get four pickle balls, four balls every month. And I think there's, they have a whole selection of clothes and, and bags and stuff. You get a 20% discount on all the rest mm. of the stuff. So basically you're paying, what does that work out to? 30 times six. 180. 180 for a paddle um, every six months. To So, you know, it's, and the paddles, if you don't use this subscription, cost $200. And you can get a, 10% discount with the code. So, you know, and there are a lot of selection of paddles. They have, I think, six models in their lineup, maybe eight. Uh, so there's Kevlar paddles, which we'll talk about today. There's raw carbon fiber and different shapes and thicknesses and that sort of thing. So I don't know that that would work for me. I, maybe there are some people out there, but I'm not the type of – I don't think I've ever bought the same paddle repeatedly. Right. Or even more than once, for that matter. Right. And not just because I'm I'm in this space, but even before all this, the the technological advancement in paddles is such that you, I don't think you would ever want to buy the same paddle. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to them, they they will they're not going to be having the same paddles forever. You know, that they'll innovate. But you and I are on the same page. Like, does not appeal to me to do any subscription based model for paddles. No, uh, but it appeals to some people, I'm sure. The only thing that I might consider a sc- subscription for would be balls. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we did play with the balls. We should talk about those before. Overgrips. What's that? And overgrips. Because <laughs> I seem over, to go through be a nice, lot of right. And lead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not lead. Tungsten. Tungsten. Uh, but let's talk about the balls. So given that it is part of the subscription, you do get four balls per month if you're on the subscri- subscription. Uh, we played with it today. I thought it played okay. I'd say it 
plays similar to a Franklin. You felt it was a little stiffer than a Franklin, maybe a little harder. I would say more along the lines of Vulcan. Okay. I did notice a little bit of out of roundness after we played some really hard points, um, but not to the. You could see it. Some little tiny little. Yep. Yeah, uh, out of round. the ball in the air. You, I couldn't see anything. Yeah, it was really subtle. It didn't take any bad hops because of the out of round, like the Vulcan, you know, or even the Selkirk, new Selkirk balls. So overall, I felt like the ball was decent, you know. I'd play with it if, if I was on the subscription. It plays similar mm-hmm. to other top, top-tier top balls. Uh, what did you think of the paddles themselves? So we had two varieties today. We were talking about only their Kevlar paddles. So the first one is their Royale, which is a 16-millimeter hybrid carbon fiber Kevlar weave. So it's this, again, this 3K twill cloth with a uh, peel ply over the top for their raw texture. Uh, I like the colors. This is an elongated shape. Uh, It's a very heavy paddle. (laughs) I think the swing weight on this is like 128, maybe 126. So somewhere in that really, really high percentile range. I noticed that a lot, especially coming from the Rhombus R2 Ripple, right. yeah, which has like 100 with weight, 113. Kind of two extremes right there. Maybe two extremes. With the extra weight, there's some perks. You know, there's a lot of plow through with this paddle. Uh, there's, there's decent power from the baseline. Not a lot of pop at all at the kitchen. So it does match its, its name, its control paddle. Uh, in that sense, it's a fairly decent control paddle. I don't think it's going to be for most people because of the heavy swing weight. I felt so slow with this paddle, like I was playing through molasses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for that, I was, you know, for forehands, pushing shots to the right, backhands, mm-hmm. pushing shots to the left, and I, I wasn't enjoying that aspect of it. It hits well. Yeah. Serves are great. Drives are great if you can get through that slowness. Serves and drives are great. Resets are great if you can predict where the ball's going, anticipate that. Yeah. You don't have to flip it or anything fast. But yeah, I mean, it it plays well for what it is, an elongated, heavier paddle. But like I said, I think most most people are trending toward lighter weight paddles. So. Speaking of, of trends, <laughs> there's a trend for some manufacturers out there where they are slapping their logo on paddles way too many times. I think the word synergy or some version of it shows up on this paddle like 14 times. <laughs> You're right. I didn't notice that. It's, <laughs> it's on, just too much. It's on the rubber band. It's down here. It's, it's up on the here. side. It's on the top. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I get it. It's right. synergy. <laughs> All right. So this is the, the 13 millimeter version of their same shape. This is called the Supreme. And it is also Kevlar carbon fiber hybrid weave, which I thought was pretty cool because there's only one other Kevlar paddle on the market this thin. And that one's the Packle. There's a company called Packle. Mm. I've not hit with it yet, but I've never uh, even seen that one. Yeah, so it's the thinnest Kevlar paddle you can get, short of the Packle. So I did like this one. So this rem- remedies the swing weight issue. Uh, the swing weight on this is true, much more tolerable. Uh, given the Kevlar face, it did not feel as as uh, stiff as most 13 millimeter really thin paddles do. And there's a little bit of uh, forgiveness there. Forgiveness is the wrong word, but it's a little bit plusher than I would expect a 13 millimeter to feel like. Uh, but you do get really good pop at the kitchen with this paddle. Now, again, this isn't my shape, but I'm overlooking that. This is, you know, I'm trying to be unbiased here. There are people that love this elongated shape. Uh, it does have a 5.5 inch handle, both of these, so it's good for two E's. It's a little bit narrow, so the sweet spot follows that. So the sweet spot on this one I didn't mention on the Royale. Really good, as you would expect with a heavy paddle. Uh, it just that heaviness absorbs the ball better. This one was a little more narrow, and I did add three grams of lead on at four and eight o'clock, which helped a bit in that regard. Uh, sweet spot's not bad, but as with any thinner paddle, sweet spot's going to be a little bit smaller. But I like this one. I, I thought it hit pretty well for a Kevlar paddle. It played kind of unique because it is of that thinness that really poppiness there's a lot of offensive option at the kitchen with it uh from the baseline the power wasn't wasn't 
great. I'd say mm-hmm. it's fair power. So you're not missing too much in terms of the power, but that's not a strength. Pop is a strength. But overall of the two, I would definitely prefer this one. I think this is going to appeal to a, a broader audience. I would agree with you as far as the kitchen play goes. It, it's a great blockers paddle. Um, for me, it, I didn't feel a whole lot of plushness with it. It felt very stiff and hard to Did me. Okay. Um, I was not able to work the ball as well with this paddle as with the Royale 16 millimeter control or obviously with the, the ripple. Mm-hmm. It felt like balls were hitting this paddle and j- just jumping off the face with very little dwell time. Yeah. And for me, I, I need to be able to work the ball with top spin, with whatever, and I just wasn't able to get it with this. But those blocks, man, it's point and shoot. Wherever that ball is coming in, it's going to come back at the same angle very right. quickly. Yeah, I noticed we talked about this during the game. Like you weren't getting this top spin that you usually get with your stroke. I was. I measured the stats on both of these, and both of them got really good spin. Fourteen. I haven't run. The, I haven't crunched the numbers yet and averaged them. The 16 definitely got better spin. I was seeing some 2400s in the grouping. So I imagine the spin's going to be 22, 2300. That surprise me. Maybe. 14 felt a little lower. I was seeing mostly like 2100s in there. But I was still, that's still a pretty decent amount of spin. But yeah, I noticed also the 14 the, doesn't pocket the ball as much as the 16, and you're not getting as much spin. Uh, quite as much with the 14. But yeah, that was affecting your technique for whatever reason, yeah. more than mine. You know, so that is something to Your be aware. Technique was just better today, John. And I was. So, this is one of the only days I was competitive with you. <laughs> 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 it's because you're injured. Oh, you're just fighting some foot issues here, <laughs> making me crazy. Bust out that red light. <laughs> All right. What's next? Anything? Uh, anything else you want to talk about for the paddles of the week? No, I think we're good there. We want to do a little unboxing, though, this week, right? Oh, yes. Thank you for the reminder. Oh, before we move on to the unboxing, I did want to show uh, some, of the, some of the Synergy products. So this is their bag. It is a really nice-looking bag. I dig that quilted look. Yeah, it's like a it's faux leather. It actually <laughs> smells like leather, too. I don't know. It's, it's like the PU leather. You but, dirty bag sniffer. <laughs> <laughs> but the zippers are nice, and you know, it's it's a standard. No, that's kinda, a good. I like the black and gold. Kind of nice. yeah, good accents, but it's also you know, th- this is like the standard tennis shaped bag, shortened up for pickleball. Good looking bag. Are they a tennis company formally? No. Okay. They're all pickleball. The products look look very premium, so you get a very premium feel. So this is like if you were to order the get the if you just ordered it outright, or you got on subscription plan for the premium paddles. So. This is the unboxing experience. We got to get a bigger studio. Ready? Yeah. Oh, I like that too. Yeah. So uh, this this is what the Kevlar paddle came in. And it's like a another quilted kind of peeled leather case that it comes in. We've got the eraser. It's really nice. We've got the overgrips, extra overgrips, and then some lead bars here. So it. Okay, they just went up a notch. Yeah, overall, it's a very premium feel. It's not like they send you a paddle, a new paddle, after you pay the subscription in a padded envelope and be done with it. Like, everything was, you know, they, they crossed, their, uh, crossed their T's and dotted their I I's. I do appreciate a good unboxing. And speaking of unboxings, now, Matt from company Chorus sent us the new colorways, and we had not opened them yet, so we yeah, wanted to look at them. surprise. Now, one thing is, this is not a proper unboxing because... He's, he did send them in an envelope, so it's not what he typically sends them in, like a, a <laughs> regular fair. box like this. But we have not looked, seen the colorways yet. so let's No, and this, this, uh, this company and this paddle have been a favorite of ours recently. It's been my main paddle now for, what, three months? That's a lifetime for you. <laughs> that's, that's about the, my average run for, for main paddles. All right, so the, to be clear, this is the first time either one of us are seeing this. Yes, sir. Oh my god, that orange handle is really orange. Is it? It's good for me. I'm colorblind. <laughs> All right, you do the white All one, right. and I'll do the orange one. You know, white's going to be my favorite. All right, so you put the uh, static weight and swing weight. So 8.06 static and 113.7. Yep. Swing. What's yours? I'm at 8.08 and 114.8. I think Matt said he sent me lighter ones, though, so we'll have to see. I like this black and white. <laughs> that is sharp. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the black and white. And he upgraded the grip, too, so that uh, <laughs> that ribbed grip is gone. 
The rib grip's gone. Good, good point. Thank I forgot you, Matt. to mention that. He may have upgraded the grips themselves too. I, f- I feel like the older grips were the foam, so they're squishy underneath. This feels like it's probably your thing. This grip is nice. Yeah, the handles feel nice, the so. sharp edges on the handle, which is good. Not in a bad way. That is like a neon orange. Is it? I dig it. <laughs> oh my god! I don't, I don't see it the same way as you That's do. That's not what I was expecting at all from the the preview pictures. I probably. I'll definitely put a white overgrip on this, which I think will make it nice. But I, I used to play with an Electrum uh, Pro 2, which was had the orange edge guard. Never this since is way then. beyond that. Is it? I dig it. <laughs> I'll play with this. <laughs> yeah, it'll get. Oh, That's cool. It's a good, good texture, too. Yep. Feels grippy. Very nice. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so those are finally being shipped out. They may be sold out already for... The second batch they have, I think they ordered a few hundred paddles uh, in orange and white, and there's still the black ones, too. I think the black ones are definitely sold out, if I remember correctly. Anyway, so. You've personally sold probably a few dozen of them because now everywhere locally, everybody seems to be playing with it. That's true. I've seen a lot more in the wild, <laughs> than, but I, I, I don't sell them <laughs> myself. No, but, yeah, I think it, people saw the videos and – there's there's an extra yeah rubber band too, all right, very cool. Let's let's deep dive. Eddie. All right, want to talk cores? Yeah. Uh, so I had a follow up for last week. Talked about polypropylene cores and you know is it true that polypropylene is just plastic and they're all the same cores, the same plastic in the cores? No, there are grades of polypropylene, but one of the things I mentioned. I want to make a clarification on, and that was the melting point of polypropylene. And like I said, it's up around 350. It's not quite that high, actually. It's more 320 at the minimum and up to 340 for certain grades of polypropylene. But I don't want to mislead people in thinking, okay, that's the temperature they thermoform paddles at, so they stick it in a mold and bring the oven up to 320. No, that's the point where the plastic actually turns to Liquid, right, the melting point, proper melting point. So it turns out that you can work with the polypropylene up to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit before it loses its integrity. So the presumably the ovens are no greater than 180 degrees Fahrenheit when they are thermoforming paddles. And that might have been an issue, people pushing the temperature too much, mm. which created... So that's a permanent loss of integrity? I don't know. Uh, that's that's what on some of the spec sheets I looked at for polypropylene. And shout out to Nam from from Carbon. Uh, he reached out to me with with some information about this. He saw the pod last week and was like, "Hey, the temperature of actually baking for thermoforming is much lower mm. than than the melting point." So we talked about it, and he sent me some spec sheets, and and it said uh, use up to 180 degrees for for this polypropylene in thermoforming. So. Uh, but yeah, there there is some variation in terms of heat tolerance for polypropylene. So perfectly isotactic polypropylene has a melting point of 340, which is the highest. And I don't know exactly what isotactic <laughs> is. It has something to do with with uh, like the regularity of the uh, repeating units of within the polypropylene uh, within the poly- polymer. So the more regular the polypropylene, the higher melting point and higher heat tolerance it has. But regardless, there are grades and that's something there grades in terms of heat tolerance, grades in terms of density. There's there's virgin polypropylene like olive oil. So polypropylene one of the benefits of it is it's highly recyclable. You you melt it down and you can use it again and again and again. But it also over time loses its integrity. Mm. So similar to like extra virgin olive oil, there's virgin grade polypropylene, right? So there's grades in terms of, is it first use or recycled? There's grades in terms of density, grades in terms of shear strength. So what what do consumers make of all this? Or, or does it even matter? It does, I mean, most people aren't going to care, but I think it's it's worth noting that these grades exist and hopefully they'll be, I don't, I don't want to say transparency because it's not like, Paddle companies are hiding it from us necessarily, but there's jargon that paddle companies use to explain their polypropylene, and I would like to see a movement away from jargon into actual specs. Like, I would love to know what the 
density of the polypropylene in a paddle is, together with all the other specs on the web page for that paddle. I would love to know what the heat tolerance is and what the thermoforming temperature was, you know, because all that's useful information. So similar to how paddle companies advertise the, the grade of carbon fiber or Kevlar, I think it would be great to start talking about grades of polypropylene. But you're right. We, we barely even know, like, the, the spacing of polypropylene within the core. Right. And, or, or the cell size. Right. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah. 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 I mean, sometimes companies will say small cell, but they don't mention the millimeters, you know. Sometimes they do, but mostly not. So yeah. I, I think that, that's all important information. And even in, though it might be overkill for most consumers, I think there's a fair chunk of us out there that would like to know. Uh, if that translates into performance somehow or durability, uh, yeah. more likely. Definitely performance on, on density and cell size and that sort of thing. There's a big performance difference. So I think we're seeing it already in terms of how the paddle techs play and engage. They have these Gen 1 cores that are not thermoformed, but they hit like trucks. Yeah. And they sound different. And that's the grade of the polypropylene inside. So, you know, I think there's an interest in that, clearly. There's a benefit also to not thermoforming because thermoforming has its issues with core crushing and, and you know, core breaking eventually. So, yeah, I think, I think it'd be useful to start talking about for paddle companies to start telling us more about their cores. One more deep dive topic. So you and I have been using slice caps on and off. I've really adopted them. I use them on most of my paddles, but I have not used them yet on – wide body or standard shape paddles because I didn't feel like they needed them, right? So I've been playing with the Rhombus R2, which is a standard shape, and my lead setup was... Before you jump into that, what, what would make you say that you didn't think that they would be needed? Well, they, they already have a low balance point and a low swing weight, and that's one of the primary reasons of adding the slice or weight to the base of the handle is to bring down the balance point for more maneuverability and... and allow you to put more lead or tungsten along the edges without it get, becoming too head heavy. So given that it already has a low balance point and a low swing weight, I never really felt the need. So my original lead setup, weight setup, was this tungsten tape from the top of the overgrip up to close to the middle of the paddle. So all along the neck, up onto the wide edges of the paddle. This is 0 0.5 grams per inch pickleball effect tungsten tape. And then above this, I actually, so I played with this first with no slice cap, just the tungsten. And it still felt a little twisty in my hands on off-center shots. I felt like it needed a little bit more stability. And it set, starts at such a low swing weight that I went ahead and added uh, two strips of three gram lead tape, those smaller denser strips right above the tungsten here. And that felt great. I played with that for a week and a half and you know, was just loving the way it felt. But for the sake of experimentation, today I, I took the stock uh, butt cap off of the R2 and added a 28 gram or one ounce slice cap. And then put the wrap back on. By the way, Eddie, I, I used your technique. I, I did not put the stock grip back on. I put two layers of overgrip. So it's got that nice ah, firm feel. Nice. So you're well done on that. You're influencing <laughs> me. And uh, I took off the three okay. gram strips of lead above. So I've got some data on what all of this changed in terms of static weight, twist weight, uh, swing weight, etc. So the stock Ripple, this one in particular, I did the same measurements on the same paddle. Static weight, 7.74, mm -hmm. so really lightweight. Right. Swing weight, 103.89, so just 104. Super low swing weight, stock. Twist weight, 6.13. That's pretty good for such a lightweight paddle. It's over six, right? But not outstanding, which I, which I felt. You know, That's, that's why I, <clears throat> I do feel it plays better with some perimeter weighting. Hand speed index of this was only eight stock. So again, the lower scores on the hand speed index, the more maneuverable, more lightweight it feels. So that's, that's a really low hand speed index, which is good for maneuverability. Okay, modification one was without the slice cap 
with the tungsten and then with the three gram lead strips above that. So that brought the static weight up to 8.33. Mm-hmm. It brought the swing weight from 104 up to 109, which is still very manageable swing weight. Twist weight w- jumped over s- seven, so 7.17. So again, went from 6.13, gained a whole point, 7.17. Brought the hand speed index up to 30. So that's a pretty significant increase in, in the hand speed index, which is going to make for the slower paddle. Now, you can think of it in terms of a scale from 1 to 100. 30 is still very low. And I did not feel like my hands were slow mm-hmm. with the weight set up with the, without the slice cap and with the extra 3 grams above this. And that's similar to kind of what you're playing, right? With, exactly. Yeah. With Same twist weight numbers, same okay. swing weight numbers. Yeah. I think it played well like that. Yeah. No complaints at all. But I wanted to f- figure out if I do like slice caps on this. So, like I said, I took everything off, put the gram at the base. First of all, I, I do love the, the way the slice cap beefs up the base of the handle. It just fits in the palm of your hand um, a little better. Matching blue too, John? I mean, so, that's over the top. Yeah. <laughs> I do see blue. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it. It's sharp. Yeah, huh? It looks good. Um, and then the overgrips... By the way, is that the S13 S13 slice cap? S13 shape, so yeah. the, S13 the, very, model. the most common one. The most say. common fits on this, yeah. And, yeah, then I played with the day. Oh, let me give you the stats first. So the static weight went up to 8.81, which is a beefy Getting paddle. There. Yeah. The swing weight uh, dropped down to 106.2 because I took some lead off right. of the sides, okay. right? So, again, the original swing weight was 104. Now it's 106 with this setup. The twist weight's a little lower than Mod 1. So, Mod 1 was 7.2. This is 6.6, 6.55, right? So, that's going to make sense, taking a little weight off the lateral edges. It's going to mm-hmm. have a little l- lighter swing twist weight, sorry. But that's still a pretty respectable twist weight, pretty well above 6. And then the hand speed index actually got lower. So it dropped from 30 with mod 1 to 15, so a half it for mod 2. And again, the original hand speed index was 8. So we went from 8 up to 30, down to 15 now, which is crazy to think about because this is the heaviest stock st- static weight of any of the three. It's all about balance, man. It's all about balance. Yes. So, yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the weeds again on hand speed index, but I'm weighting the uh, whippier motion a little h- higher in this in terms of the watts required to flip a paddle 180 degrees using this motion, this motion, and this motion, right? So I'm, I'm weighting the wristier movement a little heavier. So uh, it does result in a lighter feeling, swinging paddle. It doesn't feel lighter when you're just holding it in the hand, but it definitely feels a little bit more maneuverable with the slice cap on. So... Now my impressions of how it plays, our impressions, because you got to play with it too, mm-hmm. and we had yours to compare it to side by side. So I liked it. <laughs> I did not expect to enjoy lowering the balance point that much. By the way, the balance point on this is the lowest of any paddle in my database because I haven't used a slice cap on a shorter paddle before. Uh-huh. I brought it down to something ridiculously low, zeroth percentile, <laughs> right? So... Um, and I noticed some differences in the play. Uh, I didn't miss really the less twist weight, the the lower twist weight. Uh, it didn't feel like it had the same issues it did without the slice cap and this setup alone. So remember I said before I added the slice cap, I just put this tungsten tape on. I did not have the three gram lead strips. I just felt like it needed a little more sp- stability on resets in particular. And dinks, you know, sometimes on my volley dinks, I would just, I would, it would just die on me. So my accuracy is not that great. So I needed a little bit more. That did shore it up with three grams. But going back down without the three grams, but adding the slice cap, I still felt like I was getting that stability. So it's adding some stability, even though it's not adding the weight specifically on the edges of the paddle. But it increased the whip of the paddle. So I was able to be a little whippier so I was getting a little more I felt like I was getting a little more juice with my serves with that whippy motion at the end as well as punch volleys counters at the kitchen I wouldn't say I I wouldn't say yet that I would prefer this over without the cap and the weight here 
Uh, it's up for debate for me right now. I'm going to continue playing with this for another couple of weeks, and I'll give you some updates as we go. But I was surprised how much I liked it today playing four or five games with it compared to yours. What are your thoughts, Eddie? I'm, I'm still uh, waiting to make judgment okay. on that particular setup. Um, I was feeling like I wasn't as connected with the paddle. Uh, the balance point was so low, the swing weight fairly low, that I, I couldn't feel the paddle coming around. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something I need for, I guess, my style of play. Um, I'd almost like to see Mod 4 with the three grand strips restored at, at 9 and 6, or yeah. 9 and 3, right? Um, to see what that does. Because I felt like I, I also missed the, the twist weight that you took out mm-hmm. from... Gotcha. Uh, from that particular setup. So you're noticing some less less stability on off center shots. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like I need a little bit of swing weight to really sort of groove the feel of a paddle. Right. Um, less than, you know, when you get into 108, 109, or even less, mm-hmm. uh, for me, I'm, I'm just sort of, sort of flailing out there. I'm not, I'm not feeling the weight of the, the paddle. Right. I will say that th- it felt like the one of the things I noticed about slice caps and adding weight to the base of the handle is that with a really low swing weight, it doesn't feel as flimsy, and there's more plow through, even with weight at the base of the handle. Not the same as adding ba- weight to the top, you know, but you know, playing with a 106 swing weight, which is this mod two that I have here, didn't feel like a 106 swing weight. It felt like it had a little more plow through but but yeah fair points and i i need a little more time with it to to recognize it myself whether or not i I prefer this over not having a slice cap on it my my feelings towards a slice slice cap in general have are continuing to evolve um where as at the beginning of using them i i felt like i wanted to reduce the balance point of these paddles to see if i could gain some hand speed or maneuverability. Now I feel like what the slice caps gives me is the ability to add weight to increase twist weight, mm-hmm. but not lose sort of that stock maneuverability. 100%. That's kind of where I am right now, and, and who knows, it, it may continue to evolve. Yeah. It allows you to put more weight overall on your paddle, which can be a good thing. It comes with perks to have more weight overall because there's more plow through, there's more forgiveness, makes the sweet spot wider, all those good things. But if you put too much weight in the wrong places, increase your balance point, increase your swing weight, then it's going to feel like a brick in your hands. Exactly. Yeah. Not in a good way. So let's do mod four and five for next week. And <laughs> okay. Continue we'll keep, to we'll keep going. This. All right. Q&A. We've got some questions this week. Yeah. Do you want to read the first start? one? Let's start with the first one. Uh, at 65, at best PB, um, talking about replaceable like paddle components, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think single unit cores, including their surfaces that contact the ball, will end up being replaceable rather than just the surface, as in the, the reload mm-hmm. technology. If there was a standardized paddle frame with standardized core plug and play, you could change cores to your preference. What are, yeah. you, what are your thoughts on that? I thought this was a fun question, and, and the reason why I put it in is... Originally, on one of my videos last year, when I was talking about how grit wears down and, and exploring whether or not the grade of carbon fiber plays a role in the durability of spin, in the comments section, somebody brought up the future of pickleball is replaceable faces, replaceable grit. And I wrote back, and I was like, that's a fantastic idea. Uh, the owner of Reload was also commenting in those threads, and he was already working on it at that time. So we started talking. Uh, so that kind of arose, you know, in a grassroots way. This this the Reload that we have now, and I think this was this is kind of fun as a thought experiment. I don't think it's nearly as feasible as just replacing the face with new peel ply, but the thought of okay, why don't we make standardized frames per paddle model and then replace not only the grit but also the entire core because presumably the core will a break eventually or lose its power b become irrelevant as newer cores arise with new foam enhanced cores or even new grades of polypropylene 
you know, like like the engages, like the paddle techs that hit harder. So you just pop that out of the frame, pop in a new core slash layup, surface layup, you know, conglomerate. Interesting, but is is there enough <laughs> of the paddle left? If you take away the the face and the core, is there enough paddle left to to make this kind of technology? To, to warrant it. <laughs> right. And, yeah. I mean, and you're basically talking about a frame and a handle. Frame and a handle and you know, whatever whatever goes into that. So taking a look at like the Thompson paddles, that's a pretty creative frame that they've come up with with the with the urethane edge that goes all the way around. And then there's like thermoformed edges, you know. Um, but there's also the risk that the frame could become irrelevant. I don't think that would happen as quickly as, as the core. And then there's the issue of how much would they cost? Because it's going to be more expensive to replace the core and the surface layer sure. than it is just the, the surface layer, the top surface layer with the grid. So, you know, are peop- would people be willing to pay double what it costs for the, the reload stickies so sixty dollars to replace the core and the face that now you're getting a kind of trade-offs right well sixty dollars is getting close to the price of a new paddle you know when you're talking about the jelly bean for example yeah uh not so much for and, the and two of those gets you a great paddle <laughs> at, at <laughs> yeah, 150 exactly. bucks yeah but i thought it was i thought it was fun yeah kind of a, a good idea uh it would also just be more difficult to, to replace a core. Like, I mean, d- what's going to hold it in there and prevent right. it from falling out? You know? I mean, potentially following this thread, um, you could have all sorts of replaceable components, including the frame. So mix and match your frame to your handle, to, yeah, your, that's true. to your core and face, and you got your, you know, I do how like, many combinations there. I do like customizing my paddle. That would be fun. To... I'm surprised at that. You seem like a just play a stock <laughs> kind of guy. Just give me, I'll just play with whatever they give me. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move jump on. to one more question here, and then we can call it a show. Well, we've got we've got two more, but but yeah. No, well, I'm skipping to the last. <laughs> okay. Good. 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 <laughs> How does the Jelly Bean compare to the Vatic Pro Prism Flash? That's the one I'm interested in. Yes, I think that's a good question, and these are two budget paddles. Yep. Run a hundred dollars. Yeah. Exactly. Hundred dollars each. Ninety dollars with codes. And let's throw the quartz in there while we're at it. Yeah. I don't have enough time with the quartz yet, but but definitely I think these two are comparable. Well, the quartz is a Gen One, first of all, so there's no edge foam. I'm in thinking it. budget here, though. Yeah, these are the Jelly Bean and the Vatic Prism Flash are both Gen One point five with the edge foam. Mm-hmm. They're both raw carbon fiber. So the Vatic Prism Flash has been the the king of budget paddles. Like, if anybody wants a paddle for hundred dollars, the best one you could get up to now has been the Vatic Prism Flash, hands down, not even close, right? Now there's the jelly bean and and the quartz. If you're you know if you like shorter handles and and uh, yeah quartz, I'd say doesn't have quite the sweet spot as both of these. I don't I wouldn't necessarily say that. Yeah, we need more time. We should hit them together before we make that judgment. Yeah, yeah. together with the jelly bean. I, I I I went back and forth one day with the quartz versus the Vatic Prism Flash. And I felt like the Prism Flash had quartz is definitely on the softer side. Softer, but I felt like well, the sweet spot was. Okay. Not not as not as comparable. Anyway, I'll reserve my judgment until we we get Fair more time enough. side by side. But in terms of the, comparing strictly the jelly bean to the prism mm-hmm. flash, so there's a shape difference first of all. Right. And jelly bean is the wide body, flash is the hybrid shape. So the the flash is going to have a little bit more leverage because it's longer, presumably a little bit more power, versus the jelly bean, which is going to have a wider sweet spot, more forgiveness. But the jelly bean also has a layer of fiberglass in it a little extra zing a little extra zing so in the layup i think it's the third layer down is fiberglass now if i went after i saw this question i looked up my metrics i do have power and pop and spin metrics on these and they're nearly they're really close spin is almost identical 2100 something on each so really good spin uh power the vatic prism flash edges out the jelly bean and power but slightly and then vice versa for pop. Jelly Bean has more pop than the Vatic Prism Flash. So overall, I'd, I'd say really comparable. If you want the widest sweet spot, the biggest sweet spot possible, it's Jelly Bean. If you want more pop, it's Jelly Bean. If you want slightly more power, it's Vatic Prism Flash. Or if you just like that shape better than the wide body. So which one are you taking to the court tomorrow? Oh, if I had a choice between the two, I'd, I'd go Jelly Bean. Same. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's just that one, well, a couple of extra little things, you know, the, the wide body shape together with the long handle. The long handle, yeah. which gives it more leverage. A, B, the um, fiberglass layer in there also gives it a little more oomph. It's just like, wow. This is super control oriented paddle with a little bit of a little bit of uh, defensive power, uh, which is a good spot to be in for a hundred dollar paddle. Nice evaluation. There we have it. All right. That's all. We're at the end, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty seven no, podcasts down. Bag. Yeah. You wanna close on anything? Any pithy thoughts? No, I'm happy to be back. It's been a couple weeks. Yeah, it's true. My son was here for a visit. Uh-huh. People and, missed uh, you, Eddie. I saw some comments. Oh, that's really nice. Last week. That, uh, that's really nice. Missing I mean, some Eddie. Chris and Will are kind of the kings, right? So it's uh, to be in any sort of mixed company with those guys is gr- really well, great. Next time we have one or the other or both on, we'll, we'll both be here. for that. That would be fun to have three or four of us. Oh, my gosh. That would be crazy. Yeah. All right. Eddie, good to see you, man. See you next time. Next week. <laughs>